Hi everybody and welcome to Dark History, hope everybody is well. Today's video, as you would have seen from the title, is called The Invasion of the Wolves. Yep, I know, strange title, but I promise there's an interesting story behind it. We will focus on Paris, the city of lights and love, the French capital, and the scene of not one, but two invasions of man-eating wolves. Man's battle with wolf stretches to the start of history. Some obviously stayed wild and undomesticated, and others, like our furry canine friends, have become domesticated, and experts aren't quite sure why. A couple of theories are humans use wolves for hunting. This theory has merit as dogs are still used for hunting practices around the world today. However, wolves eat a lot, one deer per 10 wolves a day, which would mean a lot of furry mouths for our ancestors to feed and share with. Or, one bright spark caught a couple of cubs and kept them as pets, unknowingly providing humans for centuries to come with the joys of furry babies. There's a problem with this theory though. Humans thousands of years ago weren't too fond of carnivores, wiping out animals like saber-toothed cats by either eating all of the meat or hunting them intentionally, making the possibility of love for wolves a little unlikely. But the jury's still out. Nevertheless, humans always kept a certain fear of wolves, as in fairy tales, mostly the main evil protagonist, but in reality people have actively sought them out for extermination, as in the case of my home country of England, where the last wolf was eradicated in the 15th century. The people of the Middle Ages were primed to see evil in everything that was bad, and they had been battling wolves for centuries. During a very cold winter in the 9th century, things reached their culmination. For a few decades, the packs of wolves had bubbled in numbers, and rulers in Europe had responded with increasing their efforts to kill them. It didn't work. In fact, things were about to get worse. In 846, the winter was so harsh, written accounts from the time talked about cutting northern winds lasting throughout the entire winter season and up until May. Until then, due to the relentless hunting, wolves had learned to stay clear of open fields and to keep to forests. But now, starvation drove them out. Dozens upon dozens of wolf packs would now hunt out in the open and descend even upon well-protected villages. Written accounts of this time, specifically from the French Gallic region, read like horror stories. Wolves tearing people apart in broad daylight. Hundreds of wolves surrounding villages like an army or standing quietly by the side of roads waiting for prey. How much of this is true, we can't be sure. What we do know about wolves now tells us that when they are starving, they do go on rampages, but not as excessive as described by people from the 9th century. So, our tale today. The first wolf invasion came during the winter 1419 to 1420. Europe at the time was in the grip of a bitterly cold winter. In modern day Turkey, the river Bosphorus had frozen with the ice being thick enough to walk from the Asian side to Istanbul or Constantinople as it was known then. In the west, France was debilitated by the inaccurately named Hundred Years War. Inaccurate because it lasted 116 years, but I suppose it really doesn't have the same ring to it. But I digress. The winter 1419-20 was equally severe over the whole country, with very low temperatures and copious amounts of snow falling for prolonged periods. Paris at the time was bursting outwards from the encompassing walls. It was Europe's largest and most cosmopolitan city, but was occupied by the English and subsequently war-torn. Poor Parisians were suffering the effects of not only an unusually harsh winter and occupation from their mortal enemy, they also had to contend with a famine. The people would spend all of their daylight hours searching for food just to stay alive. It was so cold during this winter that bottles of wine, grape juice and vinegar froze in the cellars of Parisians' houses. In some cases, icicles formed on the vaults of cellar roofs, the River Seine, which had previously been in spate, froze over in less than three days, and the ice quickly became firm enough to walk on. Not only were the people feeling the pinch, in the surrounding forests and woodlands, packs of wolves were often starving. Numerous packs of these wolves, as hungry as the people, advanced into the suburbs of the capital, trying to find a few morsels of food. 
Every night, they roamed around the streets of Paris, digging up recently buried corpses in the local graveyards and ate them. Anyone who tried to intervene was ripped to pieces and eaten, presumably as a second course. Any wolves which were killed were strung up in the streets by their back legs the following morning, as perhaps a slightly over-optimistic warning to the rest. But unlike the formative years, the Parisians and the wolves stayed relatively civil. Moving on in time, there had been five unbelievably cold winters in succession over the whole of the European continent. In England and France, the famine was so severe from 1437 to 39 that it was second only to the worst years ever in 1315 to 1317. These latter years were so wet that virtually all the nation's crops failed. As many as 10% of the population may have eventually perished in decades characterised by crime, disease, mass death and cannibalism. From 1437 to 1439 though, the winter cold was such that English people in the countryside were driven to attempt to make bread from fern roots and ivy berries. In Paris, the unfortunately starving people only had to contend with the wolves in 1439 when a desperate pack entered the city in search of fresh meat. They ripped out the throats of 14 people and duly devoured them. This occurred in the area of Montmartre in the north of the city and the Prote Saint Antoni in the east, right next to the Bastille prison. It wasn't until 1450 that we begin to see a mass amount of wolves entering the city of Paris and actually coming into contact with the populace. From 1450 to 1850, and possibly beyond that, into the early years of the 20th century, the so-called Little Ice Age held sway over Europe. In 1457 to 1458 in Germany, for example, extreme cold froze the Danube such as the thickness that an army of 40,000 men was able to camp on the ice. Two years later, during the winter of 1459 to 1460, the entire Baltic Sea was frozen and people could cross between Denmark, Germany and Sweden, both on foot and on horseback. In France, the most severe weather came right at the beginning of the Little Ice Age, during the very worst winter of 1449 to 1450. During this period, the weather in France was very wet, extremely cold, and there were consequently huge quantities of snow. Indeed, the winter had begun as early as October 1449, when a large number of olive trees began to die of the cold across the whole country. It was during this exceptional winter that Paris became a victim of its most famous attack by man-eating wolves. This pack, the wolves of Paris, are thought to have killed and eaten a large number of hapless human victims of all ages over the course of the winter. The animals initially entered Paris through the very large holes in the dilapidated city walls, which had been built some 250 years previously in the early 13th century. Of course, the original builder, King Philippe Augustine had intended the walls to protect the city from human invaders rather than animal predators. The leader of the pack was a wolf named Cortard, which means bobtail, as he had a tail which had been docked or shortened in some unknown incident. The description of Cortard at the time said that he was reddish in colour, not really a pigment that you would expect, a pure 100% common. Eurasian or Middle Russian forest wolf. At first, there were around 20 wolves in the Parisian pack and they killed a dozen people. Gradually, wolf numbers built up and the list of victims grew longer and longer. The first month, supposedly around 40 people perished, with a total killed of the whole winter of several hundred. They included, for most part, anybody the wolves found wandering around the city at night or any individual who were outside sleeping rough. Inevitably, the inhabitants of Paris in that winter of 1449 to 1450 were swept by the feeling of total panic. Attempts to kill the wolves in their dens were totally ineffective. Eventually, Parisians became infuriated with the spate of animalistic murders, so a brave group of volunteers found a couple of unwanted cows and killed them. They then set off, dragging the mutilated corpses along behind them on ropes. As they left a bloody trail, eventually the wolves began to follow the scent, and slowly, slowly, Cotard and his bloodthirsty colleagues were lured and prodded into the very heart of the city. When the wolves reached the Ile de la Cite, they arrived at the large square in front of the Cathedral of Notre Dame, which is called the Pavis Notre Dame. Here they were trapped, surrounded by pre-prepared wooden barricades. 
Finally, the angry Parisians stoned and speared the entire pack until every single wolf was dead. Cortad was paraded around the city in a cart, pulled by the triumphant crowd. Another attack of wolves happened in Soissons, which is located northeast of Paris. A man-eating wolf terrorised the commune over a period of two days in 1765 attacking 18 people, four of whom died with their wounds. The first victim of the wolf was a pregnant woman attacked in the parish of Septmon on the last day of February. Diligent locals had taken the second trimester fetus from the womb to baptise it before it died, when the wolf struck again not 300 yards from the scene of the first attack. One woman named Madame Damfrey and her son survived only by fighting together. On the 1st of March, near the hamlet of Corcelles, a man was attacked by the wolf and survived with head wounds. The next victims were two young boys named Boucher and Marcel, who had been attacked on the road to Paris, both badly wounded. A farmer on horseback lost part of his face to the wolf before escaping to the local mill, where a 17-year-old boy was caught unaware and slain. After these atrocities, the wolf fled to Béchon, where it partially decapitated a woman and severely wounded a girl, who ran screaming to the village for help. Four citizens of Bachon set an ambush at the body of the latest victim, but when the wolf returned it proved too much for them, and the villagers soon found themselves fighting for their lives. The arrival of more peasants from the village finally put the wolf to flight, chasing it into the courtyard where it fought with a chained dog. When the chain broke, the wolf was pursued through a pasture where it killed a number of sheep and into a stable where a servant and cattle were mutilated. The episode ended when Antoine Savarel, a former member of the local militia, tracked the wolf to a small lane armed with a pitchfork. The wolf sprang at him but he managed to pin its head to the ground with the instrument holding it down for roughly 15 minutes before an armed peasant came to his aid and killed the animal. It wasn't just France who suffered with wolf attacks throughout the ages. Another infamous wolf invasion takes us to Finland and the city of Turok, where a trio of man-eating wolves went on the rampage in 1880 and 1881, killing 22 children with an average age of 5 years and 9 months. Their trepidation caused such concern that the local and national government became involved, calling for help from Russian and Lithuanian hunters as well as the army. The wolves killed their last victim on November the 18th, 1881. On January 12th, 1882, an old female wolf was shot and 12 days later, an adult male was poisoned, putting an end to the attack. One of the dead wolves was sent to the hunting museum of Haimaki. The other is in the St. Olaf school, where they can still be seen today. The third wolf ended up as a doormat and disappeared. Anyway, thank you for joining me again for Dark History. If you enjoyed it, please leave a comment and a like, as it helps no end. If you think someone in your friends or family may like this, and share the video and maybe consider subscribing. I have a podcast on all major podcast providers and TikTok. Links will be in the description below. Thank you again everyone for watching and your continued support. Please join me for the next video and more Dark History.